Not long after, word came that Atu Island had been taken as well. A long, uncertain night followed, with nerves taut and tensions high, as Kondo's force might report engaging the enemy at any moment. However, the morning brought neither enemy attacks, nor even snooping planes. At length, Kondo reported that he had sent out search aircraft far and wide, but had found only empty sea. Even longer-ranged searches from Wake Island came back with the same negative answer. It gradually dawned on the Japanese that the United States carrier force had withdrawn from the scene. Ugaki remarked at this point that we had no choice but to give up our intention of launching an all-out counterattack with the whole combined fleet. These words signalled the abolition of the final Japanese hopes of somehow reversing the verdict of what more than one called the tragic battle, Spruance's prudence had paid off. For the Japanese, it meant that saving Mogami and Destroyer Division 8, despite their being considered doomed for a while, was the only apparent consolation prize of the battle, along with securing two miserable, mist-shrouded islands in the Aleutians. Unbeknownst to Yamamoto, though, the dawn of the 7th brought the final and clearly the most important Japanese accomplishment of this otherwise disastrous campaign. At 5.01 a.m. Yorktown finally sank. It had been apparent during the dawn hours that her end was near. Finally, at 4.43 a.m. she had turned completely onto her port beam ends, revealing the deep wounds left by Tanabe's strike. For some time she just lay there, like an exhausted, harpooned whale. Then the stern began to lower, until at last gallant Yorktown lifted her bow ever so slightly and slid stern first beneath the waves, descending gracefully three miles to the seabed, carrying fifty-seven dead with her. There she would lie in sepulchral darkness for nearly fifty-six years, until rediscovered in 1998 by an undersea expedition led by Dr. Robert Ballard. Even now, with the end of the battle clearly in sight, certain loose ends vexed the harried and tired combined fleet staff. Since Tanikaze's run back toward Hiryu had been interrupted, the carrier's final fate remained unclear. It was felt that if she'd actually been boarded by the enemy, then they would have intercepted some indication of this in the Americans' radio traffic. However, submarines dispatched to confirm her sinking found nothing. As a final, and as it developed, futile ruse, the heavy cruisers Mayoko and Haguro, one destroyer division, and a tanker were ordered on the evening of the 7th to try and lure the enemy westward with false messages. This effort, like all the others before them, came to nothing, though they kept at it till 13 June. However, with sunset and the descent of darkness on the 7th, at long last it was time for most of Combined Fleet to begin its weary, disconsolate voyage back to the inland sea. Apart from some designated reinforcements to the Aleutians covering forces, the rest of the fleet was now going home. Yet, as the fleet's course was adjusted at midnight, there came a final ignominy. During the turn to starboard, destroyer Isonami slammed her starboard bow into destroyer Uranami's port side amidships. Uranami received damage to her funnel uptakes, cutting her speed to 24 knots, but Isonami got the worst of the encounter. A metre of her bow was chopped off, and she could consequently make only 11 knots. Once again, a collision had dangerously cut the speed of two vessels. Though the fate of Mikuma and Mogami was still fresh in everyone's mind, Destroyer Squadron 3's flagship, the light cruiser Sendai, stayed behind with her wounded charges. But by now the enemy was far behind, and Sendai would shepherd her little ones home without incident. The accident only stretched already worn nerves, and now even the fiery Ugaki was truly ready to be quit of the whole debacle. Yamamoto had long since decided likewise, the Battle of Midway was over. Emperor Hirohito had not learned of how the Battle of Midway was going till nearly the end of the day on 5 June Tokyo time, when an official of the Naval General Staff found the courage to inform the Emperor of the disaster then unfolding. Stunned into silence, Hirohito had withdrawn and had held audiences only with naval staff officers, after which he largely kept his own counsel on the matter. Even Lord Privy Seal Kido Koichi, one of the most trusted members of Hirohito's inner circle, was not informed of the disaster until 8 June. Kido's diary of that fateful meeting shows that Hirohito chose to put a brave face on the matter, 
despite Kido's assumption that the news of the Navy's losses would cause him untold anguish. However, the Emperor's countenance showed no trace of change. Hirohito went on to declare that though the loss was regrettable, the Navy should not lose its fighting spirit. He told Kido that he had ordered Admiral Nagano to ensure that future operations continue to be bold and aggressive. For his part, Kaido was suitably moved. I was very much impressed by the courage displayed by His Majesty today, and I was thankful that our country is blessed with such a good sovereign. There is some question, though, whether or not the cloistered emperor truly understood the full import of the calamity. What is clear, however, is that Hirohito assumed an active role in covering up the matter. On 10 June, at a joint command liaison meeting, the Navy made a presentation on the battle that concealed the true magnitude of the losses from the Army representatives present. Thus, the Army was left in the dark for some time afterward regarding the Navy's ability to carry out further operations. Moreover, Hirohito took steps to ensure that news of the disaster was tightly controlled, both within the military and Japanese society. Outside of the Emperor and top members of court, Almost no civilian in Japan knew what had happened. Even the knowledge disseminated among the ranks of the military was carefully controlled. On 9 June, Hirohito designated General Ando Kisaburo, a devotee of Tojo, to serve as minister without portfolio in coordinating this task. It was a shattered, sombre fleet that re-entered Hashirajima on the afternoon of 14 June. The final run-in toward Japan had been tense, jittery, and full of submarine alerts. Dense fog hung over the inland sea, so much so that the main body had had to be guided through the narrow Bungo Suido by aircraft sent out from the Seiki Naval Air Group. Yamato dropped anchor at 7pm. As she did so, she was met by a launch from Nagara, which had made port the day before. Though he had been asked to report on the 15 with a commendable sense of duty, Admiral Nagumo chose to face Yamamoto without delay. The following morning, Nagara drew near battleship Kirishima, a file of boats then ferried the exhausted and frustrated officers of 1st Air Fleet over to her, as she had been designated the temporary headquarters of the mobile fleet. Once on board, Lieutenant Commander Yoshioka Chuichi, 1st Air Fleet's Assistant Staff Air Officer and Commander Genda's right-hand man, began working on completing Nagumo's official report. It was already overdue and Yoshioka had significant obstacles to surmount in compiling it. Not only did the excessive secrecy interfere with his fact-checking, but only two major sources of documentation had been rescued from the destroyed ships, Akagi's logbook and the detailed action reports of the four carrier air groups. From these, Yoshioka was charged with compiling a chronicle of the action. Given the lack of available materials from the carriers, he was understandably obliged to fall back on the reports of Battleship Division 3, Cruiser Division 8, and Destroyer Squadron 10. He interviewed Nagumo and appended the Admiral's written battle summary. Despite time pressures, Yoshioka ultimately completed his task with commendable skill. The result was the famous Nagumo Report, which described the actions of 1st Air Fleet from 27 May to 9 June 1942. The report is dated 15 June 1942, although reports were filtered in as late as 21 June. While Yoshioka and 1st Air Fleet staff were thus cloistered, the rest of the fleet was recuperating, reprovisioning, and caring for the wounded. Sadly, for many of the men, making it back to port was only the beginning of their ordeal, rather than the end. On 11 June, Hirohito issued a directive to the Naval General Staff, that might have caused many of the sailors to doubt His Majesty's benevolence, namely, that the midway wounded were to return to Japan under tight security and be forbidden contacts until they could be healed, heartened, hushed and reassigned. This policy was put into effect as soon as the fleet reached Hashirajima. The wounded were transferred to the hospital ships Hikawa Maru and Takasago Maru, which in turn transported 280 and 338 cases, respectively, to naval hospitals at Kure, Sasebo and Yokosuka. Many of the men were classified as secret patients and quarantined in special wards, cut off from both other sailors and family alike, in order that no word escaped regarding Kido Butai's destruction. Both Fuchida and maintenance man Arimura suffered these indignities, 
as did Soryu's badly burned executive officer, Commander Ohara Hisashi. Only specially cleared nurses and doctors were allowed into the wards, and there were fewer of those than need wanted. No communications in or out, not even letters from home, were permitted. Some of the men weren't allowed to leave for a year or more, and were shamed by the medical staffs at having been defeated. Those left uninjured were also deemed second-class citizens. Many of the surviving officers were dispersed to outlying commands. The bulk of the enlisted men were designated as replacements for units in the South Pacific, and were sent there as expeditiously as possible. No home leaves were allowed. The survivors thus were denied a final chance to say goodbye to family and loved ones, before being shipped to the Southern Theatre, where many of them would ultimately meet their deaths. Thus, the Imperial Navy compounded its own errors by treating its own men shamefully. Civilian cameraman Makishima Teyuchi, who had filmed the attacks on both Akagi and Kaga, only to lose his priceless footage in the subsequent fire, found himself in an internment camp of sorts for several weeks. Even when released, he was warned not to go to Tokyo or he would be arrested by the Kempeitai, the dreaded military police. He too was shortly shipped back out to the South Seas, far away from anyone to whom he could spill the beans. To the Japanese public, the battle was portrayed as a great victory. On 11 June, for instance, the Japan Times and advertiser trumpeted Navy scores another epical victory and claimed two American carriers sunk. Within days, another American heavy cruiser and submarine were added for good measure. Japanese losses were left curiously vague, although an 11 June broadcast with prominent civilian naval commentator Ito Masanori noted that Japan had lost two carriers in return. Nevertheless, this was a small price to pay, Ito said, considering the brilliant war results obtained off Midway, which were beyond all imagination. The latter statement was certainly true, but not in the way Ito intended. This marked a rather radical departure in the history of Japanese wartime propaganda. Up until then, it had been customary to provide filtered views of the fighting in China that avoided unpleasant details. However, the Japanese news had not previously resorted to telling blatantly fabricated lies. Hirohito, though, was pleased with the public's response, and the next day floated the idea of issuing an imperial rescript to the commanders at Midway commemorating Midway. Hirohito's advisers, however, persuaded him otherwise, pointing out that things were not so desperate as to lower His Majesty's heretofore sacred pronouncements to the level of propaganda. From the Midway wounded, however, there was no way that the disaster could be concealed entirely. Maeda Takeshi, recovering from his leg wound, found out about the Navy's cover-up when one of the nurses snuck a copy of Asahi Shimbun, Japan's leading daily newspaper, into his ward. There, large as life, were the headlines that Maeda knew were all a big lie. To Maeda's way of thinking, if Japan had to resort to such outrageous deceits, it couldn't win the war. On 10 June, the Navy Ministry had sent a message to its commands, declaring, It was decided to quote our damage in the Midway Sea Battle as one carrier lost, one carrier heavily damaged, one cruiser heavily damaged, and 35 planes failing to return. Officially, Ugaki announced on the 15th that except for those made public by the General Staff, nothing should be revealed about Midway and the Aleutian operation inside of as well as outside the Navy. In the Navy, it would be announced that Kaga was lost, while Soryu and Mikuma were seriously damaged, but their names would not be announced in public. The final policy on how the Battle of Midway was to be understood or reported, even in official communications, was fixed and issued on 21 June. A bulletin by the Chief of Staff for the Sixth Fleet spelled out the new orthodoxy. As for the ships lost and heavily damaged at Midway, the policy about announcing is that secrecy will be maintained and discretion manfully exerted. Kaga, Soryu and Mikuma will be taken off the ship's register when there is suitable opportunity. Akagi and Hiryu will remain on the ship's register for the time being, but will not be manned. The transfer reassignment of crews will be ordered gradually. Concerning those killed in action, the Personnel Bureau and Personnel Section will gradually notify the families of the deceased, but the name of the ship sunk will not be mentioned. The policy is to handle the killed merely as individuals. Concerning damages, Akagi and Hiryu both caught fire and were heavily damaged. 
Tanikaze, Isakaze, and Arashi, each slightly damaged. Mogami, Isanami, and Uranami were hit, Mogami moderately damaged, and others slightly damaged. Thus, the need for secrecy trumped all other considerations. This gives an indication about how the aftermath of the battle was discussed, even into the post-war years. In an immediate sense, the admission that Akagi and Hiryu were so heavily damaged as to be unmanned may have been just a face-saving move. Reading between the lines, it still meant that all four carriers had been knocked out. What is equally intriguing is the point-blank obfuscation regarding Akagi and Hiryu's scuttlings, despite literally thousands of witnesses. Similarly, one wonders why there was a difference between the details of Soryu and Kaga's fabricated fates and those of Akagi and Hiryu. It suggests that the scuttling of Soryu and Kaga may even have been concealed from the naval general staff after the battle. Given such an atmosphere, it is not surprising that many of the records of the battleship's logs, war diaries, etc. were destroyed after the war. No such indignities as were heaped on the Navy's wounded were inflicted on Combined Fleet's leadership or staff, despite their bearing most of the immediate responsibility for the catastrophe. In fact, to outward appearances, nothing happened that would indicate a great battle had just been lost. No announcements were made. No heads rolled, nor were there any major changes made to staff appointments. Admiral Yamamoto was still in charge of Combined Fleet. Admiral Nagumo was put back in charge of the new carrier force centred on Shokaku and Zuikaku. To the Western observer, this all seems rather incredible. After all, Yamamoto and Nagumo had just presided over a naval disaster rivalling Salamis or Trafalgar. Without delving too deeply into the reasons and responsibility for the disaster, we'll deal with that shortly. The fact remains that in a Western Navy, a failure of this magnitude would most likely have resulted in the swift punishment of any responsible parties. At the very least, careers would have been ruined. Yet, Nagumo continued in his current role until October 1942, and Yamamoto would remain head of Combined Fleet until his death in April 1943. How did this occur? The short answer is that even in the wake of his greatest defeat, Yamamoto was still in a position of strength. First, at least in the eyes of the Japanese public, which had been fed a steady diet of victory since the outbreak, Yamamoto was the genius behind the Navy's triumphs. Having just proclaimed Japan's most recent victory, cashiering a man who spent a significant portion of his time answering adulatory fan mail from the nation's schoolchildren would raise ugly questions as to why he was being replaced. Indeed, even in the dark days of late 1944, when any fool could tell that the war wasn't going well, Japan's military never had the moral fortitude to admit that it had lost so much as a single battle to date. With the Navy already in cover-up mode after Midway, how could anyone, even within the Navy, come out and say what needed to be said? This speaks volumes about the larger needs of the Navy as an organisation that the assessment of responsibility and the ability to truly learn from the battle was secondary to preserving internal solidarity and organisational loyalty while maintaining outward appearances. It must be remembered that the defeat at Midway had an impact on inter-service relationships with the Army. The underlying tensions between the two services remained fixed and it is almost certain that the Navy would have wanted to prevent the Army from making any hay as a result of the defeat. Indeed, the Navy initially concealed the full extent of its losses even from Tojo, despite the fact that he was the head of the government. As such, it is perhaps not surprising that the Navy was reluctant to undertake dramatic shake-ups in Combined Fleet's command structure. The same motivation was true for Naval General Headquarters, admitting failure at Midway also meant admitting that the Navy's strategy-making procedures had been hijacked by a subordinate command. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s, numerous incidents of such insubordination had occurred within both branches of the services. The truth was that superior commanders within the Japanese military hardly ever brought their subordinates to heel, and Admiral Nagano wasn't about to start with Yamamoto. While the Japanese utterly failed to come to terms with their defeat at the level of high command, the Navy itself did make adjustments. In the area of carrier design and operation, for instance, the Japanese reacted in several ways. First and foremost, 
a higher proportion of refueling and rearming activities were now to be performed on the flight deck. It was recognised that the enclosed space of the hangar, while better sheltered, also held the potential for disaster should a hit be taken. Japan's carrier designs also morphed to meet the perceived threat. Carrier Taiho, then building, would sport a heavily armoured flight deck, as would supercarrier Shinano converted from the hull of a Yamato-class battleship. Both of these carriers were intended to operate in the fore of any new battle, serving as armoured refuelling points for the air groups of the more vulnerable fleet carriers coming up behind. These latter vessels, the carriers of the Unrayu class that would emerge in 1944, were almost carbon copies of the basic Hiryu design. Yet they would incorporate important improvements. Each had only two elevators, augmenting the strength of the flight deck, albeit at the cost of slowing deck operations. Increased use of foam firefighting equipment was incorporated, and the Navy also began to employ the American technique of draining fuel lines when not in use. Portable damage control equipment, such as gas-powered pumps, would begin making its appearance later in the war as well. Not surprisingly, the whole topic of damage control procedures was reappraised, particularly with respect to firefighting techniques. Accordingly, new courses for damage control were established. Specially selected enlisted men from the ship construction and engineering branches were given one-week courses at the workshop and repair school in the fundamentals of damage control technique. Likewise, all line officers were given at least some training, amounting to about two weeks during wartime. However, the Navy was churning out officers and enlisted men at a prodigious rate. Training for line officers had fallen from three years to just 18 months, and that of enlisted men had dropped from six months to four. A few weeks' worth of training was hardly sufficient to transform raw recruits into seasoned practitioners, especially when it appears that much of the training was less hands-on than simply watching demonstrations in firefighting given by the experts. This was compensated, to a degree, by regular exercises aboard ship. However, Shokaku's Hayos and Taiho's subsequent losses because of faulty damage control, particularly with regard to firefighting technique, leaves open the question as to whether or not the Japanese actually made significant strides in these areas after Midway. Pilot training also had to be accelerated in the wake of such a serious defeat, and the Japanese took steps in this direction as well. The numbers of cadet pilots graduating had already increased in 1941, although they would not swell dramatically until 1943. In this way, the Japanese managed somehow to continue fielding air units throughout the theatre, However, the way in which the Japanese went about fulfilling their needs was far from optimal. Given their numerical inferiority, it was inevitable that the length of training would decline as the war went on. Yet the Japanese made no effort to ensure that the training that was provided was of the best possible quality. This, in turn, was linked directly to the uncaring attitude with which the Japanese military treated its human capital. Unlike the United States, which rotated experienced aviators home and then either promoted them to squadron commands or put them into training billets, Japanese aviators were rarely furloughed. Often this was simply the result of vast difficulties encountered by Japan's overworked merchant marine in moving men and material around such an enormous battlefield. But the common lament in the forward squadrons became Shinanakute Wakeshite Morenai. They won't let you go home unless you die. The outcomes of Japan's belated expansion of her pilot training programme were twofold. First, the vital knowledge and techniques of the veteran airmen were not passed along in turn to the newer Japanese aviators being rushed into service. As a result, these youngsters were fed raw into combat against increasingly well-trained American pilots. The quality of Japanese air groups, as a result, became increasingly uneven, with diminished cohesiveness in comparison to the elite early war squadrons. Often, too, these replacement pilots made crucial mistakes early in their combat careers that led to their simply being killed off, when a similar error in training might have been caught and corrected had more experienced instructors been present. Japan's combat aircraft, which lacked adequate protection for their pilots, only compounded this trend. Thus, by the end of 1942, Allied intelligence had already noticed the beginnings of a sharp decline in the effectiveness of Japanese air units. 
The second major consequence of Japan's misguided pilot rotation policy was the deterioration of the veteran aviators themselves. Stationed in the harsh conditions of the South Pacific, they faced extreme heat, humidity, disease, and limited access to adequate food and water. Additionally, the relentless strain of combat took its toll on these experienced pilots. Despite their initial fearsome reputation, it became evident that Japanese aviators were not superhuman. The physical and emotional toll of their environment and continuous combat caused many early war veterans to deteriorate rapidly. Even those with extensive combat experience, accumulating hundreds of hours in the air, began to exhibit signs of physical and emotional breakdown. Under such challenging circumstances, it was unreasonable to expect anyone to maintain peak performance indefinitely. Consequently, many pilots became increasingly careless and indifferent, leading to a decline in overall effectiveness. In a military that already took the word fatalism to new extremes, the results were inevitably much higher casualties among senior aviators than real need demanded. As 1943 opened, therefore, airmen from the pre-war cadres were more and more difficult to find they had almost all been killed. Intriguingly, one of the most immediate effects from the Battle of Midway was a change to Japanese carrier doctrine. In this area, at least, the Japanese made an honest effort to diagnose and correct what had gone wrong. In fact, this process actually began before the fleet anchored at Hashirajima. At 8 a.m. on 10 June, as the main body was still steaming back to Japan, Yamato had requested Nagara to come alongside. One by one, the members of 1st Air Fleet staff were winched over to the battleship via Britches Boy. They were then shown below to meet with Yamamoto in the Admiral's cabin. It was an emotional moment, Ugaki remarked later that Nagumo's staff were still in their heavy winter uniforms and looked considerably exhausted by their ordeal. The atmosphere was uncomfortable. Kusaka, ashamed, started the briefing by saying, Admittedly, we are not in a position to come back alive after having made such a blunder, but we have come back only to pay off the scores some day. He had concluded by asking Yamamoto to give them another chance. Yamamoto, obviously deeply moved, replied that he would. Kusaka had then proceeded to report on the reasons for the disaster. Among other things, he noted that the searches on the flanks of the carrier force were not sufficient, and opined that it would have been better to have launched some aircraft earlier in the morning, before daylight, with others launched closer to dawn. Here indeed was the genesis for the more sophisticated two-phased searches that would later be formalised within the Imperial Navy's scouting doctrine. Kusaka, rather presciently, also anticipated the need for functionalising the carrier divisions within a task force, including using one group for attacking, and another for maintaining the readiness of a reserve force. He further advocated the usage of a dedicated carrier for interceptors. Crucially, Kusaka also acknowledged that there were situations when speed of reaction was more important than an escorted strike. It's clear that a number of these elements were carried forward into Combined Fleet's reassessment of its doctrine. This process continued rapidly after the fleet made port in Kura. The first, most visible change was the disbanding of 1st Air Fleet, which was renamed 3rd Fleet. The 5th Carrier Division, Shokaku and Zuikaku, was officially recognised as the core of this new carrier force and was renumbered the 1st Carrier Division. Carrier Division 4, Junyo, Hiyo and Ryujo was renumbered Carrier Division 2. Battleships Hiei and Kirishima, now designated the 11th Battleship Division, were attached directly to 3rd Fleet, thereby formally removing them from the Battle Line and 1st Fleet. Likewise, the two operational survivors of Cruiser Division 7, Kumano and Suzaya, and the veterans of Cruiser Division 8, Tone and Chikuma were directly attached to 3rd Fleet as well. 3rd Fleet's core unit was to remain the carrier division, but it would be a three-ship unit composed of two heavy and one light carriers, the light carrier was charged with fleet defence and would carry primarily fighters. The heavy carriers would retain a mixed air wing, but the mixture of aircraft was adjusted. Fewer torpedo aircraft were to be carried, in preference for more fighters and dive bombers. Shokaku and Zuikaku's fighter and dive bomber complements were increased from 21 to 27 apiece. 
while the torpedo planes were reduced from 21 to 18. The roles of the aircraft were modified as well, with faster, more agile dive bombers designated as the main attack weapon for holding flight decks and rendering the enemy carriers inoperative. Torpedo planes would then be used to attack and sink damaged carriers. The battle plan for the carrier fleet was changed drastically as well, much like the agonising reappraisal that the United States Navy had undergone in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor. The Imperial Navy now grappled with the doctrinal consequences of its own calamity. Combined fleet for the first time now explicitly recognised that the aircraft carrier was the centre, the main objective of the decisive air battle. Surface forces will cooperate with them. The battle squadrons of the Navy were subordinated to the purposes of the carriers, a radical shift in attitude. Given its earlier triumphs, of course, it is ironic that the Imperial Navy had taken six months longer than its opponent to come to this conclusion. But from now on, battleships and other screening units were to be directly incorporated in the carrier fleet and would steam with them to the anticipated scene of battle. Direct visual contact would be maintained with all units so that the force as a whole could operate under conditions of strict radio silence. The carrier fleet would also rely more heavily on the reconnaissance assets of other vessels and land-based air groups. However, upon reaching the battle area, the screening forces were to be split off. A novel formation was worked out that was designed to provide the maximal amount of warning time to the carriers of incoming enemy air attacks, even at the expense of the fleet's battleships. The carrier division was to be preceded by a scouting line of battleships, cruisers and destroyers, that would be placed anywhere from 100 to 200 nautical miles in front of the carriers. These vessels were to be arranged in line abreast, spaced apart roughly at the limits of visual range. In addition to giving earlier warning of enemy aircraft, the scouting line also placed the eyes of the fleet, the cruiser and battleship scout planes in the van, where they could find the enemy more easily. In addition, it was felt that a widely distributed van formation would aid search aircraft attempting to return to the fleet when all ships were operating under conditions of radio silence. A friendly plane had a good chance of running across at least one of the vessels in the van, which could in turn direct it to its mothership. Finally, the heavy units in the van itself could be used to attack enemy units with gunfire that had already been damaged by dive bomber attacks thus augmenting the ship-killing power of the fleet as a whole. The proposed formation was not without its share of critics. It was recognised that the ships in the van were likely to absorb damage for the carriers. While this was not an official function of the van, it was apparent enough to the officers who would command the vessels located there, eliciting criticism that they were nothing but sacrifices for the carriers. Furthermore, it was felt by some that the detachment of the van units left the carriers less well screened than they ought to have been. Conversely, the lack of screening units might be compensated for by a lessened chance of being attacked in the first place. Given that the carriers were almost solely responsible for providing their own flak in any case, this rationalisation may not have been as far-fetched as it appears. It was also hoped that the installation of radar would aid the fleet's air defences still further. However, the very shape of the screening dispositions betrayed a lack of understanding of radar's potential in anti-air warfare. As it happened, these new plans had just been agreed upon in principle by Third Fleet staff when the campaign at Guadalcanal burst forth unexpectedly. News had come in on Friday, 7 August, that the islands of Tulagi and Guadalcanal had been heavily attacked and that American carriers were operating off the islands. Shokaku, Zuikaku and Ryujo all sorted for Truk, with the intent of battling the Americans immediately thereafter. Third Fleet Staff's plans were so new that their doctrinal concepts hadn't been distributed to Admiral Nagumo's ships before they left. It was hoped that the fleet staff would have time to go over them at Truk. However, as events transpired, Carrier Division 1 didn't even call at Truk before heading to what would later be called the Battle of the Eastern Solomons. To get the plans to Nagumo, a naval aircraft flew them out to the carriers and delivered them by hand. No time was available for any training exercises. As a result, Third Fleet's new doctrine had little impact on the battle itself. The tale of Third Fleet's doctrinal developments is a fitting place to end our narrative – 
because it is a parable for how the Imperial Navy would fight the remainder of the Pacific War a day late and a dollar short. Third Fleet's efforts at self-appraisal were honest, and their resulting doctrine contained some useful elements. If nothing else, the Navy's new battle plan finally placed the aircraft carrier at the apex of its naval hierarchy, and sought meaningful ways for the fleet's heavy units to contribute to the success of the carriers, rather than the other way around. But these efforts were completely eclipsed by the speed with which the Americans had gone over from the defence to the offence. Their ability to launch a counter-offensive in a theatre of operations as far flung as the Solomon Islands was truly stunning and caught the Japanese completely by surprise. From now on, it was the Americans who would hold the initiative. The Japanese would still win tactical victories, but for all their efforts, they would never be able to reassert any meaningful influence over the flow of strategic events. In the end, Third Fleet's efforts would not be remembered as being a key element in the resurrection of Japan's carrier force. Rather, it would be nothing more than a footnote in the coming tale of the total ruination of the Japanese Navy. Even 60 years on, correctly identifying the reasons for Japan's defeat at Midway is not a simple task, because the battle defies simple answers. Indeed, the scale and complexity of the struggle result in a host of possible reasons for the catastrophe. Unfortunately, many of these reasons turn out to be proximate, rather than root causes. Yet, if any lessons are to be gained from history, the true sources of failure must be uncovered. It is to a careful consideration of these issues that we now turn. This quest will necessarily set aside the more prominent reasons on the American side for their having won the battle. Code-breaking, of course, stands at the top of the list, and Admiral Chester Nimitz's bold leadership, as well as strong performances by Admirals Frank Jack Fletcher and Raymond Spruance, played important roles. Finally, the individual skill and bravery of the American sailors, airmen and marines, involved in many cases, provided the difference between victory and defeat. But all of these were factors beyond Japan's control, and it is safe to say that even despite these virtues, the Americans could not have won the battle without the unwitting assistance of their foes. Given the disparity in the naval forces then available in the Pacific, Midway was truly the Imperial Navy's to lose. Why did they do so? An appropriate place to begin the search is with the contemporary Japanese perspectives on the matter. Before Admiral Kusaka ever set foot on board Yamato on 10 June, he had clearly been doing a great deal of thinking on the reasons for the defeat. Inevitably, given his proximity to the battle and his ignorance of American code-breaking activities, some of his conclusions were valid, some less so. In Kusaka's opinion, the Nagumo Force's fog-bound radio transmission on the 2nd might well have led to their detection. Kusaka also noted that the aerial searches on the eastern flank of the force were not commenced early enough and should perhaps have been launched before dawn. The fact that all four of Nagumo's carriers were slated to carry out attacks on Midway, as well as holding forces in reserve, Kusaka felt, led to confusion when the initial sightings of American carriers were reported. He also bemoaned the lack of fighters for the second attack wave, although we know in retrospect that this is questionable, and that concentrating the forces' carriers meant they were caught in a group. Admiral Ugaki, in his own personal diary, endorsed some aspects of Kusaka's analysis, such as the disadvantages associated with tactical concentration of the forces' carriers. He noted, too, the lack of adequate reconnaissance. However, Ugaki was less concerned with Nagumo's scouting at the tactical level than he was with the failure of Operation K, which left the departure of the American carriers from Pearl Harbor undetected, and the fact that the heightened state of alert on Midway itself had not been adequately understood. He noted that the sheer size of the operation and the distribution of the forces was such that Nagumo could not be rapidly reinforced when needed. Ugaki also rightly harboured doubts concerning the security of Japanese plans. Whether the Americans had detected Japanese forces as they sorted from bases like Saipan, or the northern forces had been sighted by a Russian merchant ship, or Japanese radio security had simply been inadequate. Ugaki did not know, but his suspicion about these questions was not lacking. Finally, Ugaki conceded that the main cause for the defeat 
might have been that we had become conceited because of past success, and thereby failed to anticipate the steps that might need to be taken if an enemy air force should appear on Nagumo's flank. As we shall see, the Imperial Navy's hubris before the battle is a theme that has resonated with historians down to the present day, and for good reason. Fuchida Mitsuo, writing shortly after the war, expanded on the theme of overconfidence, ascribing it to what he referred to as victory disease Shoribayo, a fatal conceit and sloppiness born of contempt for the enemy. Beyond such moral failings, Fuchida also expounded a litany of faults in other aspects of the operation, including a lack of strategic intelligence on American actions and faulty scouting arrangements, both before and on the day of the battle. To these were added the dispersion of Japanese forces, caused by a failure to maintain focus on the primary objective of the operation, the destruction of the enemy fleet, instead of keeping this goal unequivocally fixed as the foremost aim of the operation. Combined fleet allowed its plans to be driven by an undue emphasis on securing the best possible meteorological conditions for the midway landing operations. Fuchida also commented on the technological backwardness of the Imperial Navy as manifested by its lack of radar and its continuing reliance on the battleship as the arm of decision. At the level of command, Fuchida also rightly contended that Admiral Yamamoto's insistence on directing the operation from on board Yamato had hampered his control of the battle. Admiral Nagumo, in turn, was faulted for failing to enforce adequate search dispositions on the morning of the midway strike. More questionably, though, Fuchida cited the Admiral for failing to use a two-phase search, as well as failing to dispatch a replacement for Tone's No. 4 plane instantly, when it became apparent that its launch would be delayed. In this, Fuchida overlooked the fact that two-phase search techniques had yet to be incorporated into doctrine. Likewise, he ignored the fact that even had Tone's sole remaining long-range search aircraft been ready, the time required to get it on the catapult, warmed up, and into the air would hardly have been less than it actually took to launch Amari. The same criticism, of course, applies to any notion of replacing the cruiser scout with an additional Type 97 from either Akagi or Kaga. Thus, the Japanese were fairly perceptive in identifying many of the proximate causes of the defeat, though obviously both Ugaki and Fuchida were totally unaware of the code-breaking activities that had played such a critical part in the American victory. Fuchida had also identified perhaps the strongest recurring emotional theme of the battle, the conceit of the Japanese. Not surprisingly, though, neither Ugaki nor Fuchida was able or willing to take their analysis further to look at organizational failings within the Navy. Admiral Ugaki did apparently offer Kusaka and First Air Fleet staff apologies on behalf of Combined Fleet Headquarters for its faults in the battle. However, this was little more than a polite nothing that reflected no real contrition or reflection on his part. Instead, the sense that one gets from Ugaki's diary is that things were very much business as usual in Combined Fleet after the defeat. There were no wrenching reassessments regarding how strategic command was exercised within the Navy. Turning to the Americans and their perceived reasons for Japan's defeat, the very technical post-war study conducted at the United States Naval War College rightly cited the overconfidence of Japanese forces. Likewise, Yamamoto's excessive reliance on the element of surprise in developing his plans was carefully noted. In the War College's opinion, though, a truly cardinal sin was Yamamoto's designing his plan around America's perceived intentions rather than their capabilities. In so doing, Yamamoto blinded himself to the possibility that the Americans might actually wish to fight and might therefore intentionally place themselves in a position to do so. Other American commentators have mirrored this tendency to ascribe the Japanese defeat to errors of analysis, while also picking up on the victory disease theme. For instance, Gordon Prang, in his widely read Miracle at Midway, mirrored Fuchida's opinion that the Japanese had forgotten the principle of the objective and had focused on capturing the island rather than on destroying United States ships. Likewise, he echoed Fuchida's opinion that Yamamoto's commanding the battle from on board Yamato had been a mistake. Pranga also correctly noted that Japan had lost the element of surprise, had dispersed its forces over too great an area, and therefore lacked superiority at the point of contact.
More questionably, however, he criticised the Japanese for having failed to carry on the fight even after Hiryu's demise, asserting, Yamamoto's forces still far outnumbered and outweighed Fletcher's in surface units. Even in carriers, from his own, Kondo's and the Aleutian force, he could have summoned one carrier and three light carriers, with a total air strength of about 50 Zeros and 60 bombers. This was air power not to be shrugged off, especially as the Japanese believed they had sunk two out of three United States flattops. Instead, following the loss of Nagumo's carriers, Yamamoto scurried homeward with his massive force like a lumbering St. Bernard pursued by a scrappy terrier. This is folly, of course, as his analysis totally discounts the primary role of air power in the battle, as well as the fatally dispersed nature of the air assets left to the Japanese, none of which were true fleet carriers. It likewise fails to acknowledge Nagumo's aggressiveness in the afternoon of the 4th, or Yamamoto's unsuccessful attempts to lure Spruance's forces into another engagement on the 6th and 7th. Pranga concluded his analysis with a rather strange admonition of Nagumo for having made Tomonaga's morning attack against Midway over large for its intended purpose. Pranga's notion that the initial attack should have been conducted on a scale more on par with Kakuta's much smaller attack on Dutch Harbour is clearly misguided, because it violates the cardinal military principle of using the maximum practical force available so as to simultaneously increase the enemy's casualties while minimising one's own. Walter Lord, author of the other seminal American account of the battle Incredible Victory, placed Tone No. 4's delayed departure, as well as Nagumo's decision to rearm his aircraft for a second attack against Midway, at the top of his list of failures for the battle. Without fully understanding the dynamics of Japanese carrier operations, he understandably also blames Nagumo for not having attacked the American carriers as soon as they were detected. Lord correctly noted the rigidity of Japanese planning in that the Americans were expected to react in a scripted fashion as well as the fatal dispersion of Japanese forces. Not surprisingly too, he also commented on the dangerous contempt for the enemy as manifested in victory disease. As can be seen, the majority of the reasons uncovered by both Japanese and American observers were proximate causes, with one exception, victory disease. Thus, the first task requisite with the completion of this survey of the reasons for defeat is to examine more closely this important recurring theme. It is demonstrable, though, that victory disease was only one among a considerable number of key factors in the defeat. The term victory disease is commonly used to designate the casual, overconfident mental attitude that took hold in the Japanese Navy after an uninterrupted string of victories in the first six months of the conflict. The resulting loss of operational sharpness and the rash of sloppy mistakes that followed are held up by many as being a fundamental cause for the defeat. The man who first popularised the phrase Fuchida Mitsuo noted that the chief symptom of the disease was simple conceit. It was the Navy's arrogant underestimation of the enemy, as well as its blithe assumption that the enemy would be taken by surprise that led to the catastrophe. Fuchida chalked up the dispersal of forces under Yamamoto's battle plan to similar arrogance, yet in his opinion, the malady was more dire than many other observers noted. Victory disease, Fuchida asserted, was responsible not just for the defeat at Midway, but was the root cause of Japan's defeat in the entire war as well. Further, he felt that victory disease's root causes lay not just in six months of victories, but rather in the Japanese national character. Fuchida wrote that, There is an irrationality and impulsiveness about our people, which results in actions that are haphazard and often contradictory. A tradition of provincialism makes us narrow-minded and dogmatic, reluctant to discard prejudices, and slow to adopt even necessary improvements if they require a new concept. He concluded that these weaknesses rendered fruitless all the valiant deeds and precious sacrifices of the men who fought at Midway. Other Japanese veterans have commented on this phenomenon as well. For his part, Commander Chihaya Masatake acidly remarked that Midway was the most splendid defeat the Japanese Navy had scored in its history up to that date, though many defeats even more splendid were yet to come. In his opinion, the cause of that defeat was nothing to wonder about, we as good as planned for it. If we had escaped that terrible disaster on that occasion, we should have met the same fate somewhere else in the Pacific Theatre, perhaps in the course of 1942 
something preordained. Why? Because it was visited on the Japanese Navy to penalize its absurd self conceit. It must be admitted that the concept of victory disease has a certain appeal to it. The Japanese were overconfident going into the battle. They were guilty of ignoring the various warning signs that manifested themselves from the time of Coral Sea onward. They did underestimate the resolve and the fighting abilities of the Americans. Yet, to suggest that six months of easy victories, or even years of hubris before the war, had proven fatally corrosive to the rational faculties of Japanese commanders from Yamamoto on down seems too simplistic. After all, humble militaries don't typically win. Indeed, before Midway, self-confidence to the point of arrogance was a crucial ingredient in Japan's victories. Thus, while the symptoms of this mental malady certainly played a significant part in the outcome, victory disease alone does not explain the breadth or the enormity of Japan's defeat at Midway. It was an important factor, but only one of several, likewise, arbitrarily selecting a group of command decisions, and the individuals to go with them to blame for the defeat is also too simplistic. This cuts against the grain of many military histories, since books on great battles customarily end by pointing the finger of blame at somebody to establish responsibility for the defeat. This is not to say that there isn't ample personal blame to be apportioned regarding Midway there is. Indeed, at a superficial level, it would be fairly easy to pick out three crucial personal failures, a cursory accounting of which, albeit with a slightly revisionist twist, might go something as follows. Personal failure number one was the inability of Chikuma's number one search plane to detect the American carriers on search line number five between about 6.15 a.m. and 6.30 a.m. This stands in contrast to the conventional wisdom, which holds that it was Tone No. 4's late launch, combined with Nagumo's decision to rearm his reserve aircraft with land attack weapons, that ultimately doomed the Japanese forces. But a careful examination of the facts shows that Tone No. 4's failings, while serious, were also somewhat immaterial to the larger issue. Likewise, Nagumo's decision to rearm, while ultimately costing his force some amount of time, was also immaterial to this same problem, Namely, that by 6.30 a.m., the Japanese could no longer forestall the launch of the American aircraft that would crush Kido Butai. Neither Tone No. 4 late launch nor Nagumo's rearmament orders had any bearing on this fatal loss of initiative. And once lost, it is almost certain that no admiral not Nagumo, not Yamaguchi, perhaps not even Horatio Nelson himself would be able to get it back. The issue of Chikuma No. 1's oversight leads to the second critical failure, Commander Genda's search plan. The lack of a two-phase search, even if it had been incorporated into Japanese doctrine at the time, had nothing to do with the case. The basic problem was simply too few airplanes and too much ocean to cover. Had more aircraft been aloft and their search sectors been overlapping, Chikuma No. 1's failure might not have been irretrievable. As it was, the breaking of a single link of the reconnaissance plan led to the complete unravelling of the plan as a whole. The final failure, of course, lies in Admiral Yamamoto's battle plan. There is no question that his operational scheme featured an overly rigid timetable and a counterproductive dispersal of forces. By making the assumption that the Americans were beaten and therefore had to be baited into fighting, Yamamoto made the crucial mistake of letting perceived intentions on the part of the Americans drive his force structure and dispositions. The plan that emerged from this flawed belief was a crazy quilt of formations and objectives, none of which were mutually supporting. When one of the legs of the table was kicked out, the entire article promptly collapsed under the weight of its own foolishness. The result was a catastrophe worthy of Xerxes at Salamis, or Tsar Alexander the Fund at Austerlitz. However, while assigning blame to particular individuals may be emotionally satisfying, in many cases it only identifies proximate causes and fails to probe the roots of the defeat. Why was Genda's search plan so scanty? Why was Yamamoto's battle plan flawed? Would a different air officer have created a better search plan for Kido Butai? And by the same token, would another Japanese admiral have created a sounder operational plan for combined fleet? As will be seen, the answer to both of these questions is probably not, or at least not in early 1942. Why is that?
To resolve these issues, a closer examination of the whole nature of failure within military institutions is required, as well as a deeper understanding of the Imperial Navy's culture. To this end, important insights can be gleaned from the cogent study by Elliot Cohen and John Gooch entitled Military Misfortunes, The Anatomy of Failure in War, which lays out a useful framework for analysing why militaries fail in battle. As Military Misfortunes points out, there has been a natural tendency on the part of both the public and historians to assign blame mostly to individuals, criminalising military failure by indicting one or more commanders.